she's finally coming back down to Salem. B and I go back 25 years when she was teacher of the year, science, uh, science teacher of the year for the state of Oregon. Uh, I was heavily involved in the uh, uh, the state science fair. In fact, I'm still every year. I, I've retired three years ago, but I'm failing at this whole thing called retirement, but enjoying everything. And she mentioned Oregon Field Guide. We also did one in the spring, uh, an Oregon Field Guide about the geology of the gorge. Uh, and uh, spent one day going up in the gorge, uh, camera crew with me, mic me up. We did 14 stops, and then they uh, condensed it down into 15 minutes. And it uh, became so popular uh, that the Portland Public Schools has, uh, has actually adopted it uh, as a uh, part of their curriculum because one of the five topics that they cover uh, in science uh, in the middle schools is the Columbia Gorge. So it's fun. And, and so uh, we had this big fire up there, the Eagle Creek Fire. Uh, and we were talking at lunch today, you know, what are they going to be doing about this? Because after uh, you have something like that, uh, you're going to have a lot of slopes moving. And, uh, and in fact, people forget that back in 1991, we had the big fire in the gorge. And because it's a rainforest, it, uh, you came by, through 10 years later and you didn't even know that there had been a fire. I mean, it burned right down back in Multnomah Falls Lodge back in 91. It did the same thing this time. Uh, and, and so this week with all the rainfall that is, was starting to fall this morning, we're going to have a lot of surface erosion of a lot of the organics. Number two, lots of rock fall, very, very steep slopes and all those roots that are holding the rocks in. And we're going to see a lot of those just like we did in 91. And then we're going to have landslides called debris flows coming down uh, like that we had in, 95, in 96 in Dodson. Uh, and we'll be seeing more of those coming up too. So it's going to be a busy uh, winter, if, especially if we continue to have a lot of, of uh, rain. But I want to uh, talk to you about the Missoula floods. And so I've been involved in the research in this uh, for 25 years. And, uh, uh, and so I, I grew up here, sixth generation Oregonian, went to Beaverton High School. Uh, I got a couple degrees from Stanford, PhD out of Colorado, and then teaching took me around the world. I taught in Switzerland, New Zealand, Washington, Colorado, and Louisiana before coming back home. And so it's always fun to come back here. And it's interesting because when I was in high school, I was interested in three things, sports, camping, and girls. And that was it. And my family never did any traveling. And when I, I'd never been to Eastern Oregon or Southern Oregon. Came back with my family with the eyes of a geologist. And, got a ch and I said, okay, family, we're going to go camping. And we're going to see this state. And I could not believe what a veritable wonderland of geology that we have here, not only in Oregon, but in Washington. And so some of this is uh, about the Missoula floods, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Anyway, we can turn the lights down just a little bit. I don't want everybody falling asleep, but uh, if you can, thanks. Uh, that would be great, too. Uh, and so what we're going to do is talk about the Missoula floods. Uh, and I rewrote the book uh, that was originally put out by John Elliott Allen and Marjorie Burns back in 1996 uh, explaining this event. It was uh, John died 17 years ago uh, and, and, and Marjorie is an English professor uh, and the main lights I don't want on are up here. Yes, that's it. Great. No, I don't want them on in the front. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and so Marjorie's an English professor, so she can rewrite it. And so I've been uh, doing research uh, in the area, and so I went, went in and rewrote it. And I, had, I brought books uh, home last night from my office because I gave the same talk last night. I had some left over, and I was going to bring them down. And what did I do? I changed cars. And so I brought my other car down today instead, so the, I have no books to sell. But um, so this is kind of showing a little bit about... Um, uh, how we put the whole thing together, the story. And we called the book Cataclysms on the Columbia, uh, Great Missoula Floods, produced by Ooligan Press, which is the uh, master's program in journalism and, and publishing that we have at Portland State. So I had six grad students uh, checking over all of my stuff as we would do this. There, here's the front cover, which is the Hanford Reach of the Columbia River. So today I have two stories to tell you. And the first one is how science works and how science doesn't work. Uh, and it's a classical story of a guy named J. Harlan Bretz who came up with the idea of these uh, floods. And he went against the thinking of the day, the geologists of the day. They said, you're crazy. This is not how geology works. But in the end, you will see that we now believe in it. And then secondly, I'm going to take you from Missoula, Montana, all the way to the coast 
uh, and, and see how it has affected us uh, in our part of the world. 16,000 square miles that we have got. So one of the greatest geological events on the face of the earth, and it's right here in our own backyard. And everything underneath us right here is Missoula flood sediments. All right, so I wanted to show you the, the two other people who uh, worked on this project. John Elliott Allen, he started the geology department at Portland State uh, back in the 1960s, a dynamic guy. Uh, and he loved doing talks just like I'm doing today. Uh, and he also uh, enjoyed writing. His dad founded the School of Journalism at the University of Oregon. If you've ever been to the University of Oregon, Alan Hall, that was his dad. His dad was kind of ticked off when he became a geology major instead of a journalism major. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other co-author, Marjorie Burns, the beautiful Burns of the, the group. Uh, and everybody said, is that your wife? And I said, no, uh, it's not. She actually was married to my predecessor at Portland State when Len retired. Uh, I, I took his job. But our two grandparents lived right across the street from one another in Portland, right next to Grant High School on U.S. Grant Place. And my grandfather was Edward Burns married to Margaret Burns. Her grandfather was Edgar Burns, also married to Margaret Burns. And so back in those days, they would get their mail mixed up because everything went to Mr. and Mrs. E M Burns. And then our grandfathers were in the same Rotary Club, downtown Rotary Club, and both of us were baptized in Westminster Presbyterian Church down the road. So we did have some connections that were there, uh, but um, uh, that was it. We are not married. Uh, so what I'm going to do is show you the final slide, just in case you all fall asleep. Uh, and so you, you go away with the story in the end. Uh, and so if we go back to the time of the glaciers, and so uh, it's from 26,000 years ago up until about uh, 14,000 years ago was the last glacial period. But towards the end, the 15 to 18,000 calendar years ago, uh, uh, you had glaciers coming down from up in Canada. Actually, it was down here. You have the continental glaciers coming down. But there was one lobe of that that grew, and that's that, that part right here. This is the Ponderay Valley. That's the skinny part of Idaho. Here's Idaho right up here, and you can see there, it's that right there. there. That lobe grew, uh, and it went all the way down, and it blocked the major river that was draining eastern Montana. We call that the Clark Fork River today. Uh, and at maximum size, uh, it was 1,700 feet high. That's three space needles stacked one on top of another on top of another. And all the water from the melting of the glaciers here had no place to go, and it filled up all the valleys and created what we call Glacial Lake Missoula. Uh, and, and, and so that huge lake, 530 cubic miles of water, dammed up by 50 cubic miles of ice, and that ice dam broke. All of that water was liberated in three days. And the computer models show that. And it came down through Spokane. And all that water coming at velocities 40, 50, 60 miles an hour cre eroded everything, creating what we call the channel scab lands. And then all that water got back into the Columbia River at Wallula Gap, where it crosses from Washington to Oregon today. Came down the Columbia Gorge and hit the West Hills of Portland. Some of it went right out into the ocean. Some went through and filled up uh, uh, the Tualatin Valley. And the rest of it went between uh, Portland, uh, sorry, uh, West Lynn and Oregon City and filled up the uh, Willamette Valley all the way down to uh, Eugene. Uh, and, and then all that water went back out into the ocean and then the dam reformed and formed a new lake and it happened 40 floods made it all the way down to here and 40 floods made it all the way down here, maybe 89 to 90 made, made it down uh, into Spokane. Uh, the first flood was the biggest one, and each one kept on getting lesser and lesser. Why? Because this was uh, at the tail end of the glacial period, and so the ice was melting, and the surface of the, it was getting lower and lower, so the ice dam was less and less in, in elevation. So that's the story, but let's go back and tell you a little bit about J. Harlan Bretz. Here's a picture of him. Uh, he was a professor at the University of Washington. He did have a wee bit of an ego, especially to stand up to all the geologists of the day. Here's a photo in his photo album that says, five great men in one photo, four don't show. Well, he's in front of Mount Rushmore. Uh, and, and so he did have a little bit of an ego. And you look at his name, J. Harlan Bretz. And you, you notice that I have no period after J. And the reason is, it, it stands for nothing. Um, he grew up in, in Michigan on a farm. And he was known as Harley Bretz the whole time. He got to college and he said, oh, Harley Bretz is not a dignified name. I'm going to go back to my given name and be called Harlan Bretz the rest of the time. 
And then when he handed in his PhD dissertation, uh, his, his advisors say, what is this J. Harlan Bretz here? He said, oh, Harlan Bretz just isn't dignified uh, enough. From now on, I'm going to be known as J. Harlan Bretz. Uh, and he said, okay. Well, he passed that and went on and became a very famous geologist in, in the end. But uh, he, so you can imagine with these six grad students correcting all of our writings, they say, Burns, you forgot the period after J. No, there is no J because it means nothing. It's just a J. So that's J. Harlan Bretz. Well, here's a picture of him in the early days uh, as a uh, professor at University of Washington. Here's his vehicle, U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, and he would go uh, to Eastern, or, uh, Eastern Washington in the summertime with his standard graduate students lined up. They did all of the work and all of the mapping that they had in those days. But what he saw, and this is what we see as geologists, are landforms. And these gigantic valleys like this where no water is in it. But it sure looks that they were carved out by big floods in the past. And then along, uh, right up in the middle of the Grand Coulee, it looks like a gigantic waterfall was here. We call it Dry Falls today. Uh, it's a state park up there. And it, here's an artist recreation, Dee Molinar's painting of this. And uh, 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 the waterfall there would have been many, many times the size of Niagara Falls that was there. And then throughout the, the uh, along the major rivers, you saw these huge gravel bars. Look at this huge thing. Look at, look at these grain silos that are down here. Uh, you have got a large, large uh, velocity to have created that. Uh, and then my favorite one is uh, West Bar. So I, I'm driving up to Wenatchee tonight for a field trip on the Missoula floods starting tomorrow. And I'm going to be staying right up here. Uh, and if you look, you've got all these ripples in here. Well, what we can do is figure out the wavelength in between each one of those. Back calculate velocities, uh, and then uh, look at the size of the cobbles and the gravels that are in there, and we can calculate how fast the rivers were going. And Vic Baker, I'll show you his picture later on, did this in the past. Velocities 50 to 60 miles an hour. The world's record for the fastest moving flood ever is only 25 miles an hour. So we're talking about something that we have never seen as humans uh, before. Uh, and then out in the center part of the state, you can see where uh, the soils have all been eroded away. Here's a little island of soil. This is what we call the Palouse Luss, L-O-E-S-S, -S, windblown silt uh, that is there. It's weathered down to the basalt bedrock that you have got. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, huge amounts of erosion occurred here. Here's another one you can see where it's eroded down here, and then the, 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 the Luss-covered uh, soils are up on the hills here. You'll see a little lake that is down here. We call it a coke lake. That was formed by huge velocities of the waters. You get little uh, uh, tornadoes occurring in there. They just drill right down uh, into the bedrock. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is in the gorge. So the dowels are to the left. Uh, here is I-84. You can look right through the guardrails and you can see the river today. But you can see how high the erosion has occurred all the way up here. And uh, you're talking a huge flood had to have come through here. And then this is the weathered soil or the lust that is up on top. So flood waters filled up this valley all the way up to there. Wow. So Brett's with his students. Uh, we're traveling all over eastern Washington mapping all of these. And in 1923, he came out with his first paper. He said, it sure looks like that there was a very, very large flood. Uh, and it came down through Spokane, Washington. So he called it the Spokane Flood, one flood, creating the Channel Scablands, which he called, and the large coolies that were there. And then the water eventually went down through Wallula, and, uh, Wallula Gap and down in through the Columbia River and out into the ocean. Uh, but uh, all of the detractors, all the geologists of the day said, first of all, where did the water come from? And he says, I don't know. I just see the landforms that are a result. And they said, secondly, if you have a gigantic flood like this, that is a catastrophic thing. And landforms in geology do not are not created catastrophically. They are formed over a long period of time by slow processes. And that was what we called uniformitarianism. That was one of the cornerstones of geology going all the way back to John Hutton, the famous geologist uh, in Scotland that started the study of geology back in 1790. Uh, and, and so the onslaught continued all the way through the 20s, that he was a heretic. They invited him in 1927 to go back to the Geological Society of America meeting, the annual meeting, which that year was in Washington, D.C. 
Next week is going to be in Seattle. So we got 7,000 geologists all up there sucking that town dry of beer, I think, in one week. Uh, and, uh, but they didn't tell him, and they said, we would like to have you come and talk about the, uh, this big uh, Spokane flood. But they didn't tell him. They lined up five other geologists after him uh, to tell him how wrong he was. Lead off guy, and they all work for the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, and O.E. Meinzer, the father of American hydrology. James Galuli, he wrote the textbook that I learned geology on at Stanford many years ago. G.R. Mansfield, W.C. Alden, E.T. McKnight, one after another after another. Where did the water come from? And you cannot cre create things catastrophically. And so he went back and quit his job at the University of Washington, moved to the University of Chicago, and reoriented his research into cave formation. And you got in the Midwest. But the onslaught continued all the way through the, through the 20s and the 30s especially. One of the guys was Ira Allison, a professor at Oregon State, right here. Uh, and, and, and he was mapping out uh, uh, what we'll see later on, what we call uh, ice-rafted erratics, all of the rocks that are not basalt that we find here in the valley. Uh, and, but he had his own ideas as to the origin. But the guy that really hated Brett's was the guy on the right-hand side, Richard Foster Flint. And Richard Foster Flint was the father of American glacial geology and glaciology. I still have his original books in my, my office because he was the classic guy. And he'd been out to the sites and he said, Bretz, you just are wrong. Uh, and, and so this continued all of the way through until 1940. And there was a guy, J.T. Pardee, who had been working with the U.S. Geological Survey up in, um, in Montana. In fact, he wrote a paper in 1910 on that glacial Lake Missoula that I showed you about just a second ago. Uh, and he just said the, it was characteristic size and things like that. Uh, and he said, you know, in this talk at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting uh, in Seattle in 1940, he said, you know, I've been, uh, I wrote that paper about Glacial Lake Missoula. Well, if you go between there and Spokane, there is a place called Markle Pass. And up at Markle Pass, I see these ripples of gravels and sands uh, and, and, and silts that are five miles long, 50 feet high, one after another, all the way through this area. Sure looks like a huge flood came through here. And he, he didn't come out and say it, but he said, you put the, it together. You have Glacial Lake Missoula over here. You have Markle Pass here, and you have the Channels Cablands over here. And he sat down. And everybody said, oh, my God, there's a source of the water for Brett's. And then two years later, then uh, Pardee came out and wrote about the rapid emptying of Glacial Lake Missoula uh, and its unusual currents. And then all of a sudden, people in the 40s said, oh, maybe Brett's is right. And in the end, what happened was he outlived all the detractors that said that he was wrong. He lived to be 98 years old. And, and, and for our students, we tell them, this is an important story. Just because everybody says you're wrong, if you've got good data, stick to the data, stick to your guns, uh, and in the end you may outlive all of the detractors that say that you are wrong. Uh, and so that's where the idea of the, these large floods, but still one flood. Actually, Brett's uh, did a final paper in 1961, uh, 20 years before he died, and he called it the Missoula Flood, one flood. But that's not the... The rest of the story, and as Paul Harvey would say, and the rest of the story is a whole bunch of guys who have been studying it. And, and so here is a picture of Brett's with Vic Baker. Vic and I did our PhDs uh, together at the University of Colorado. He's a professor down at the University of Arizona. So I'm going to be rooming with him on this field trip tonight. Uh, and, and he was a mathematical geomorphologist, and he's the guy that put all of the numbers, to, he's the guy that came up with the velocities, the power functions, and things like this associated with these incredible floods. Also, he did his PhD dissertation back in the mid-1970s. That's when our first photos were coming back from Mars. And we were seeing these incredible flood features, tear islands and erosional basins, etc. And he said, my God, these look exactly like the Missoula floods. Uh, and so he's the guy that said, it looks like we have had large floods three billion years ago on Mars when they had water there, not like they have today with no water. Uh, and so he was, he was one of the leaders, he still is one of the leaders in the research on the Missoula floods. Another one is uh, Richard Waite. Richard lives across the river from Portland at the U.S. Geological Survey. 
Uh, and he had an ooh-ah moment. And we as scientists are always looking for that ooh-ah moment when you're out in the field or you're looking under a microscope and all of a sudden it all fits. You say, oh my God. Yeah, and so, but I have to take you back to Geology 101 in order to explain that. And so if we have two flood events or two sets of sediments, if you have a valley, you can see right down here, flood waters come in, they're always going to have a lot of sediment in it, and the flood waters stop, what happens? All that sediment falls out, and the coarsest grain material will be at the bottom. If, it, if it's sand, it'll be coarse grain sand, then fine grain sand and silt at the top. Uh, and then if you have another flood event come in at a later period of time and all the water, all the water stops, you'll again have coarse grain fine to sand, uh, fine grain silt. Uh, and that's what we call a graded bed. If you have more than one of these together, we call them rhythmites. And so Richard was having his lunch in the late 70s uh, outside of Tushy, Washington, uh, and uh, right here at Burlingame Canyon. And he looked down, and he saw all these layers that are in here. And he said, holy mackerel, what do we have here? Well, he went down and looked at each, each one was coarse grain sand at the bottom. You can see ripples going from left to right, so the water was coming in. And then it graded up into fine grain sand and then silt at the top. And he counted them up, and he had 40 of them. And in fact, uh, 11 of the rhythmites down from the top, he found some white layers in there. And uh, those are volcanic ash. We as geologists of the Northwest, when we dig a hole in the ground, we find white layers of volcanic ash. We get excited because we can sample those. We can date them. We can send them off to Washington State. They can zap them and then send a little email back saying, Scott, the age on this one uh, is uh, 15,500. It's the Mount St. Helens S. Ash. Uh, and so it helps you date the deposit. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, and so he looked at this and he said, instead of just one or two floods, as he and Vic Baker had been propounding, he said, maybe we had 40 of them, multiple flood hypotheses. But when you stick your neck out, and so in 1980, he came out with a paper uh, about the multiple flood hypothesis. But anytime you have got, oops, let's see, oh, there we go. Uh, anytime you come out with a, a new hypothesis, you hope that somebody else will do research and also prove you right. Well, here's another guy with the U.S. Geological Survey working up in northern Washington, Brian Atwater. Uh, and this was Glacial Lake Columbia, and I'll show it to you later on. Uh, and he was finding deposits. And, and these are what the deposits look like. And if you look down in here, this is, very, this is all silt material. And so what you have got is dark light, dark light, dark la layers. We call those varves. Those are lake deposits. A and the dark deposits are formed in the wintertime when all the al uh, uh, algae, et cetera, dies and falls down to the bottom. Uh, in the summertime, then you have a lot of uh, light grain minerals that come in, and you can count them up. They're, they're just like tree rings that you have got, and you, you can figure out how long that lake was in existence. But in between, you've got a cataclysmic uh, uh, deposit of sands and gravels coming through. Those are the Missoula floods that came through this lake. And then it, back to a normal lake, and you have varves. And he found 89 of these sets of varves. And the ones down at the bottom, he had like 58 years. And then up towards the top, it was way less than that, maybe uh, two or three years in between them. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so, so um, as a result, it verified that we had a multiple flood hypothesis. And so when we talk about the Missoula floods, we are talking about 40 floods that made it down to the Portland area, 90 floods to Spokane. We call all of the floods that have occurred in the last 2.6 million years the Ice Age floods. The young ones, the, the 15 to 18,000, we call the Missoula floods. But then we, uh, my research and, and my grad students have found deposits, I'll show you those at the end, uh, that show that these floods have occurred all the way through the last 2.6 million years. And to, but we didn't know, did they come from an ancient uh, glacial lake, Missoula, or did they come down the Okanagan, or did they come down the Purcell Trench? We don't know where the water came from, so we can't call it ancient uh, uh, um, uh, glacial lake, Missoula floods. And so we call them ancient cataclysmic floods. Uh, and, and so the dating of the Missoula floods originally was done all in radiocarbon years. But as you go back in time, real years divert from radiocarbon years. Uh, and so 15,300 to 12,700 
uh, radiocarbon years become 15 to 18,000 years ago. And then we have new dating techniques called, uh, uh, where we use beryllium tan uh, surface dating, and we can push some of the older dates back to 19,000. Is this the largest flood that we have ever found? No, it's probably number three. And it, it, here's a list you can't see in the very, very back, but the, the top uh, eight of or nine of them are all ice dam failures that occurred du during uh, the glacial periods. And the biggest one actually occurred here in Al uh, Altai Mountains in Russia, out in Siberia. Uh, and, then, uh, and, uh, and then the very, very first of the Missoula floods uh, uh, was 17 million cubic meters per second. I mean, that is one heck of a huge flood. Now, uh, just two years ago, there was another publication that came out with a uh, flood in uh, Iceland that was 18.5 million cubic meters per second. And so this is now the third oldest that we have got. So let's go up to the ice dam and up to uh, Missoula, Montana and work our way down to the coast. Uh, and so here is the Purcell Trench, that skinny part of Idaho that is up there. And this is the valley that was filled up with the glacier. Uh, and, and it was, uh, again, 1,700 feet high. Uh, and then uh, here we, uh, and then what we do is we look at a digital elevation model here, and we put the dam in here, and we say, okay, fill in all of the areas in back of it, and that becomes our glacial lake Missoula. Now, how do we get that? How do we know to put that uh, elevation of 4,250 uh, uh, feet? Well, we go back up here to Missoula. So here is the University of Montana, Missoula. Uh, arch enemies of Portland State where I teach. They kicked our butts in football a couple weeks ago. But up and back, if you look, you can see these lines going uh, across the slope. Or if you go down the valley after a snow, you can really see them. Those are the old uh, shorelines of Glacial Lake Missoula. The first one was the biggest one, and each one got less and less. Why? Because the ice was also getting less and less uh, uh, in height. Uh, and, and so you go to the highest elevation, uh, and then you go back here and you put that elevation in and then fill it in. And that's how we know we had 530 uh, cubic miles of ice uh, and, and, and the size of the lake that you have got. It took three days to empty. Roger Denlinger did the, the work on all of that. Uh, and then the, the size of the lake was about half the size of Lake Michigan. Can you imagine Lake Michigan draining in three days? That is a huge flood that is all going down through Spokane. Just outside of town, there was a nine-mile section. We were very original in, in the names because it was nine miles from downtown. Uh, but every road cut has a story. And this is what geologists live for. And as I'm going down the road, I, oh, I'm always looking at the road cuts. Now, uh, when I moved back to Oregon, after a while, my kids said, Dad, we don't want to learn about all the geology. And, and so we, we, we were going on one of our camping trips to eastern Washington, and they got into the car, and they said, Dad, you do not speak until you're spoken to. And I said, oh, okay. But they never caught on because I had hand signals. I would grab the, my earlobe, and my wife, Glenda, would say, Scott, tell me what you see over there. Oh, thank you very much, Glenda, for asking. And, and I would do that. Did it work? No. I got three artists for kids. No science genes passed on. Uh, they're great kids, but uh, no science genes. But they did learn a lot about the geology of Oregon. And you can see, even in the back, you can see light, dark, light, dark layers. The light layers are stream deposits. They're what we call overbank deposits from floods. They're primarily silts and clays. Uh, and then the, the dark layers actually are those varves, those lake deposits, light, dark, light, dark layers that are only just a couple millimeters in size. Uh, and down at the, the very bottom, it's like 65 years uh, the, uh, for the lake uh, existing. So what you have got is lake, river, lake, river, lake, river, lake, river, all the way up. Again, showing multiple flood hypothesis. Uh, and so that was well established. David Alt, as a professor up at the University of Montana, came up with this. And so let's go to north central uh, Washington. The ice sheet's coming down. Here is the ice dam here. Here is Spokane. Uh, the ice sheet came down out of the Okanagan Valley. Uh, and it, and the, the Columbia River comes down and goes right in through here, over here, and it couldn't continue on. So the water uh, dammed up, and you had this lake. That is Glacial Lake Columbia. That is the Sandpoil Arm where Brian Atwater found those 89 different sets of varves of flood deposits, varves, et cetera. And then the water was diverted down here, and that is the Grand Coulee. So we're going to look at this whole area of Washington. 
And so uh, from Wenatchee and all the way over to Spokane. Uh, and if you look up here, uh, the first five floods, the ice had not come down out of the Okanagan or down out of uh, Chelan. Uh, and so the floods, waters went down the Columbia River and all across eastern Washington. But then after the first five floods, the ice had grown down here. And so as the water came out, it hit the ice and went down for the, probably the next 10 floods. Uh, and that carved out the Moses Cooley. Uh, and I'll be there tomorrow in the Moses Cooley. Uh, and then uh, the ice continued to grow and it moved over here. And then the water as it came out then fought, caused the water to come down here. That's the Grand Cooley. So the Grand Cooley and the Moses Cooley are caused by the flood waters coming up to the ice and then being bent down to the south. There is the Moses Cooley today, probably at least 10 major floods, and you had ice that was all along the edges over here. Uh, and then if you look at all across eastern Washington, it is incredible. I just am in awe every time I drive from here to Spokane because you're going up through all of these uh, different channels that you got. My favorite area is the Quincy Basin down here. I'll come back to that in a second. Here is a Landsat photo. This is a satellite photo that was given to Brett's in 1961. Uh, and, and you can see all of those channels. There's Spokane up there, Odessa, Grand Coulee Dam is over here. And he said, my God, this would have made things a lot easier for the field mapping if I had had that in the past. Uh, but it really, really helped. And, and then if we go down over into the Quincy Basin, as you drive through there and see all these huge potholes uh, that are created there, you say, you're, you're just in awe that, with the fact that you had huge amounts of water that came through these particular areas there. And then we come down to the Wallula Gap. All that 530 cubic miles of water had to fit through this. I'm on the river here. That's all Oregon. This is Washington here. And so we're looking, and the picture was taken right here. All that water's coming through. It can't fit through real instantaneously. So that's what we call a hydrologic dam. Uh, and so it, it builds the water up, and it, it floods this whole area back up in here. Uh, and, and, and so this is the size of that lake that was created by this. Uh, and you get these uh, rhythmites. Uh, remember we showed you down at, uh, uh, at Tushi, Washington? Just like this, you have the biggest floods at the beginning, and then they get smaller and smaller as you go up. Why? Because there's less and less material uh, to erode away. Uh, and so all across south central uh, Washington, you see all these rhythmites. And then as you go further up, then it's just everything has been eroded away. Then we come down into Oregon. So there's Wallula Gap, and the, the Columbia River comes through here. I'm going to show you a picture right here looking back towards Arlington. But it created, again, you had another hydrologic dam because the river had to bend a little bit at the Dalles. Uh, and, and so we call this Lake Condon after Thomas Condon, the father of Oregon geology. He was the first geology professor at University of Oregon. The guy was brilliant. Uh, he was a minister and a, also a geologist. Uh, and so we named it after him. And so let's go and up to this place here, look back. If we were looking at that, that river and the flood came down for the very first time, uh, it would probably take a half an hour to two hours to fill that whole thing up, and it would run continuously for two to three weeks. It would be black as all get out because of all the erosion of all the sediment and the soils up in Washington with little white specks bouncing around them. Those are icebergs uh, carrying a lot of the boulders that would be eventually deposited down here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and then eventually the water levels would go down. And so it went down all the way down through the gorge. The gorge was already here. The Columbia Gorge has been around for 28 million years, emptying into the Pacific Ocean from down in Newport here all the way up to Willapa Bay. Uh, and, but it would widen the, the gorge a little bit, and then it would also deepen a little bit. Here is, we're looking up the gorge. Uh, here's Cascade Locks, our very first dam that was built on the, on the river. That's the Bonneville Dam. Large landslide that came down and dammed up the river here. That's we call the Bonneville Landslide or the Bridge of the Gods Landslide. Now, it did not come down in, with the Missoula floods. That came down in the year about 1450 A.D. Uh, and it dammed up the whole river here, created a lake uh, 88 kilometers long all the way past the Dalles, uh, 300 feet deep. Uh, and then eventually it breached, 
All, all of that water shot right through here, scoured it all the way down to where it is today. Very treacherous area to pass through because it's all landslide material, big boulders, and we call it the Cascades of the Columbia. Our mountain range is named after the Cascades of the Columbia, and where did the, uh, the Cascades come from? A, a landslide. So we have a mountain range indirectly named after a landslide and the erosion of that form of that landslide. Uh, but you can see all the area on the Washington side up here is all tilted to the south. Uh, and the reason it's tilted to the south is because all of the bedrock is the Ohanapakash formation that is dipping down underneath the Oregon side. This is all Columbia River basalt from the top down to the bottom. Uh, and, 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 and so the whole Washington side is all landslides. They, ha they don't have any, lands or any waterfalls there over there. We have all the waterfalls on, on the Oregon side, with the Multnomah Falls, Laterell Falls, Bridal Veil Falls, et cetera. Uh, and uh, why? Because it's all straight up and down. This is the area that burned quite a bit, and that's where we're going to have a lot of rockfall coming up uh, this particular winter time. So let's continue. Uh, and this is the most studied landslide, by the way, in the Pacific Northwest. Why? Because you don't want to build a dam against something that may be moving, like this landslide. Uh, and then we continue down the river down to here, and you have Beacon Rock. Uh, and that's the heart of an old volcano. In fact, it's the youngest volcano in the whole Portland uh, Gorge area. It's 55,000 years old. We remember the b boring lava group that is uh, found primarily in eastern Portland. Uh, and the volcano used to be huge like this, but the Missoula flood scoured out around the sides uh, one after another after another. You have beautiful columnar jointed basalt that makes this up. And then as we continue down, you have another uh, large obelisk sticking up, and that is Rooster Rock. And Rooster Rock originally was attached to Crown Point right up here. How do we know? Because it's all basalt, and it has a, some very, very large plagioclase crystals in it. This was one valley that was filled up by one basalt flow that came across the state. Uh, and then the last flood came in. It undercut this, and the whole thing slid down on a landslide into an upright position. So how did he get his name? Well, the Corps of Discovery uh, did that. And, uh, and, and the Lewis and Clark, their men had not seen a woman other than Sacagawea like for eight months. They come out and here's this big thing sticking up. And so they named it a four letter word that rhymes with rock. Uh, and it stuck. And in fact, when all of the Oregon Trail people came across, they would put their wagons in at Cascade Locks and they would uh, float them down. And when they knew they went by such and such a rock that they were very, very close to the end of the wagon train, et cetera. But then when they started making maps, they couldn't put that name on a map. So a synonym was rooster. Uh, and so therefore, they call it Rooster Rock. And if you still haven't got it, ask your neighbor later on uh, what is going on here. Uh, and, and so that's the name of Rooster Rock, and it goes back to the Missoula floods. And then the water comes into the Portland area, and with, we have LIDAR, this uh, laser imaging that we can see through the trees. Uh, and, and you can see the water came out of the gorge at 50 to 60 miles an hour. And it hits a volcano just across the river in Camas. That's what we call Prune Hill. And then the water is diverted to this side right down the channel, but then around this side, and it carved out a valley. That's what we call Lacamas Lake Valley. And then it turns into Burnt Bridge Creek. And then in the Portland side, it's another volcano, Rocky Butte, the youngest volcano in Portland, 97,000 years old. And the water is diverted around this side, but then it also comes around this side and it creates a big canyon here that we call Sullivan's Gulch. When you drive up into Portland on I-5, go right through Portland, and then you get up here and turn on to I-84 going out here, you're in a valley. You ever thought, why am I in a valley? Where's the water? Well, the water's gone. It was carved by the Missoula floods. That's, that's Sullivan's Gulch. And you follow it all the way out through the Madison High School football field uh, that you have got there. And then... Why, what's this big area of sediment in, in back of both of them? Well, anytime you put a rock in the middle of a stream and the water comes down, the water will go around one side, around the other, but the area in back of it will have less velocity. And if you have less velocity, sediment that is in there will drop out. Uh, and so you will have a pendant bar, as we call it, of sediment lined up in back of it. And that's what you have got here, Alameda Ridge, which is two to 300 feet above the rest of the elevation of Portland sticking up. And that's a result of the Missoula floods. And over in uh, Vancouver, you have the Mill Plain pendant bar that is over here uh, that is deposited there. 
and then as the water comes in uh, and, and the uh, area opens up, the velocity drops immediately, and you get a big uh, bar of sediment just outside of Troutdale. Uh, and in fact, all of these areas here, this is Glendevere Golf Course, this is the Hawthorne District, these are all huge bars of sediments, cobbles, gravels, etc., that were deposited by the Great Floods. One flood after another after another, 40 major ones that made it down into the Portland area. And you find uh, similar ones up in the Washington side uh, too. So all of the to topography is related to either the water coming in, and then the water would go through Lake Oswego right here. Uh, you can see a big delta of sediments uh, under Underneath that was uh, deposited. That's where Bridgeport Mall is, for those of you who know the Portland area. And then it filled up the whole Tualatin Valley. Uh, and then the rest of the water went between Oregon City and West Lynn. Uh, this is the little village of Willamette. And I'm going to come back to that because a, a radic is found there. Uh, and then, but then the water fills up the Willamette Valley and it comes back. It all has to go back through here and out into the ocean. Uh, and, and so it can't turn where the river is here. Some of it does, but the, it's like a fire hose. Huge head that is coming out and the water comes all the way up here and then turns here. If you're taking I-205 past the Clackamas Town Center down here, you go across a big bridge, big huge valley below you. Where's the water? No longer there. It is the Missoula floods that it went here. And it goes right through Kellogg Creek, right through the East Side Commercial District, right through the Lucky Labrador Brew Pub. Geologists always use brew pubs as our geographic markers. Uh, and erodes it away and goes all the way out here and hits Alameda Ridge. And you have a big eddy current that is out here. That's where Swan Island is. And in fact, at the turn of the century, back in 1905, across the river, there was a lake, Giles Lake. That's the other part of the eddy that is there. That's where the Lewis and Clark Exposition was in 1905. We filled it all in in North Portland. And then the water went out. So all the topography that we have in the Portland area is a result of the Missoula floods. Uh, and then if we use Photoshop, one of my grad students said, this, Scott, this is what downtown Portland would look like after each one of the floods. We would have a lake there that is 400 feet in uh, elevation, and it would last two to three weeks before all of that water went out. And here is Swan Island where you had the big eddy current, and then the Giles Lake is on the other side. And then as we go around Portland and it, into all the qu gravel quarries, uh, the rock that you see is black, black, black. The real dark one, that's Columbia River basalt. Light one is boring lavas. But then what's that white rock doing there? Well, that is granite, uh, a white uh, rock that is uh, quartz and felspar with a little few black specks of biotite and hornblende. And there's no granite around here. Uh, where did it come from? It was ice rafted in on one of those I icebergs from the ice dam. And you had 40 different floods. And so we have all of these uh, glacial erratic rocks, uh, ice rafted glacial erratics in the Portland area. The most famous one that we have that was found at 400 feet elevation just outside of, of Oregon City is our most famous meteorite in the United States. It's called the Willamette Meteorite, found at 400 feet elevation, given eventually or sold to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, and uh, and you, here's a picture back in 1902 uh, when uh, they, they found it out there. What, 400 feet elevation. Something this big hitting the ground should have huge, created a huge, huge crater. There was no crater there. And in fact, Dick Pugh, one of our adjunct professors in our department, went out to the original site. You can still see gravels and cobbles of granite and, uh, and other rocks that are not found around here. So we believe that this was ice rafted in. Uh, and then the water went through Lake Oswego, filled up the Tualatin Valley that you see down here. Uh, and this is the big fan that is out here. I'm going to show you a picture in the middle of the fan and then a picture on Boone's Ferry over here. In the early 90s, I would take uh, my students into the Bridgeport pit. And, and Lake Oswego is the side here. Or everything's eroded away. All that sediment forms what we call these forset beds, these sediments that uh, are deposited down here. And then just up on Boone's Ferry, you see more of these graded beds. But instead of going from sand to silt, you go from gravels to sands to silt. Gravel, sand, silts. Gravel, sand, silts. That is because you had a high velocity coming through that particular area. Uh, and then you go into the West Hills. We have 150 feet of windblown silt. Uh, that blew up there. They call it the Portland Hill Silt in the wintertime. That's where we have all of our landslides up there. And in the wintertime, we get the big east winds coming out of the gorge. And after each one of the floods, you had all this silt that was exposed there and would be blown up on the, um, on the top up there. 
Uh, and then so the water comes through Lake Oswego, fills up the Tualatin Valley. Then eventually it has to go back out. So it comes through Gaston, down through Newburgh, or through the Tonkin Scab land, scouring it out between Shower Sherwood and Tualatin, or through uh, Tualatin, or back through Lake Oswego. Uh, and then as we come down into the, the Columbia, or the Willamette Valley, and so here we are in Salem right here, the Ola Hills and South Salem Hills that you see here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you another. So all the way down here, uh, uh, elevation of Eugene is about 400 feet elevation. So it had very little water that made it down there. And so the, uh, but uh, you had a lot of water uh, up here. So the Missoula flood sediments are about 150 feet uh, thick uh, up there in Newburgh, and they get down to about 10, 15 feet down in Corvallis. This is the map that Ira Allison did in 1935 of these erratic rocks that were found all up and down. He's the guy that didn't like it, um, uh, Brett's, but he had a different idea as to the origin. It was wrong, uh, we, we don't believe in it anymore, but he has a great map here. We get the highest elevation on those, which is 410 feet, so we know that the, the highest flood had to have gotten over 400 feet. Uh, as you go down to the beach uh, from Portland, there is a big uh, sign that says Glacial Rock. It's just outside of Willamina. You go up to 400 feet elevation. This is all argillite. It's a metamorphic rock. We don't have any of that around here. It was ice rafted into and deposited there. You go down just south of Corvallis, you can see the old soil that was at the bottom of the uh, Columbia or the Willamette Valley. And those are the rhythmites in there, about 15 to 20 feet thick in there. Uh, uh, that's at Irish Bend. Then the water goes all the way out into the ocean. Uh, during the glacial periods, uh, the sea level was about 300 feet lower than it is today. Uh, and so you had a big canyon all the way from Kelso all the way out. Uh, and the beaches were way out here. But they, each one of the floods had that sediment coming out. Normark, a famous U.S. Geological Survey marine sedimentologist, has got examples of sediment all the way out on the Astoria fan, all the way down to the Mendocino Fault uh, down uh, uh, at the end of the Gorda Plate. He's calculated 700 cubic miles of sediment has been deposited out there, and that's all from all of these ice age floods that I talked about before. Uh, and uh, in, the Tualatin, or in the Willamette Valley, only 20 cubic kilometers that we have here. Right here in Salem, it's about 70 feet thick. Uh, and, but then I, I had examples of these ancient cataclysmic floods. See all of these. This is up in the Dalles. There is the uh, Columbia River here. There's Washington. Uh, these are the uh, modern Missoula flood sediments. But each one of these layers here is a caliche layer of cemented old flood deposits that throw this whole thing throughout the, the last uh, two million years. Here are two of my grad students. These are glacial deposits up near Othello, Washington. Uh, and you, it took 200,000 years to form that caliche layer on top of it in order to, uh, um, and, and so we know that we have had floods all the way through the, uh, the last 2.6 million years. Yakima River, and you can see up in the top, these are flood deposits. I'll show you them close, and then this area underneath. And they're all cemented together with Cal uh, caliche. And so that's a 125,000 year old deposit, and underneath it, here's Erica who did her master's thesis. Look at all these light bands. Those are the silt layers of rhythmites. There are 14 of them from the top down to the bottom. Uh, and so again, uh, the, these are the ancient cataclysmic floods that we have got. I always end my talks just uh, mentioning a little bit about the relationship to wine. And, and in the United States, uh, California is the biggest producer and the most number of wineries. Washington is number two with over 800 wineries. And we're number three with over 700 wineries that we have. Uh, and, but uh, here, uh, there are the Missoula flood sediments. This is the Dundee Hills. This is the Jory soil. This is first named on Jory Hill right here in Salem. Um, and, uh, and that is the heart of wine country. It took me 12 years to get this through the legislature. Six years ago, it was voted the dumbest bill in the legislature. I was on every talk show in Portland about my dumb bill. Two years later, when it passed, uh, nobody talked to me. But why do we have a state anything? Why do we have a state rock, flower, tree, song, uh, soil? The reason is every fourth grader gets a little book called the Oregon Blue Book, and they learn why we are special, what makes our state special. And back in 1990, the Soil Science Society of America said we need to have a state soil for every state in order to highlight agriculture. 
So it's got to have uh, a lot of acreage. This is the number four acreage soil in the state. Number two, it's got to be distinctive. This is the reddest soil in the whole state, which means that it's well-drained and it's old. Uh, and in Oregon, we got to throw in a third thing. we got to unite the east side to the west side. Well, how do you get a uh, soil that is found only on the west side uh, in, in a wetter climate? How do you tie it into the east? Well, it's all found on Columbia River basalt, and it all came out of the ground. Uh, and lava flows in where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho uh, come together. So it came from the east side, solidified here, weathered over here, and they loved it. Uh, and so, but in Oregon, we don't irrigate our soils for our vineyards. Uh, and so, uh, how, how do we reduce the vigor? Uh, because you want to reduce the vigor to produce the best grapes for wine. You do it with old soils. And, and the, the soils down the uh, Missoula flood sediments are way too nutrient rich. Too much calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and phosphorus. And so you have these old red soils up on the top, like the Jory. When you go up to Washington, there's a glacial erratic. Most of the vineyards up there are on Missoula flood sediments. So how do they reduce the vigor? Up there, they irrigate everything. It's dry. And so they give them just enough water to keep the plants alive. Uh, and so eastern Washington has different types of grapes, so they irrigate, and that's how they overcome it. Here, 90% of the vineyards are on the upland areas, only 10% on the Missoula flood sediments, and we, we reduce the vigor by having those low nutrient soils that we have got. Uh, and so uh, I want, the reason we wrote the book is our newest national park is the Ice Age Flood Trail. It's a new concept past the uh, uh, Washington, D.C., le both legislative houses uh, eight years ago. Uh, and and uh, it's a new concept. Instead of going to a mountain or a valley, you follow a geological concept all the way from the coast all the way up to Missoula. And we needed to have a book that uh, kind of looked at uh, all of these different things, and that's why we wrote it. Uh, and the, the wisdom, though, in Washington, D.C., they passed the bill, but they gave no money for this new national park. So you have half of a person uh, who's in charge of this, and that's it. So hopefully we'll end all of our wars and have some of that money and go to the national park. Uh, and, um, and so the, the conclusions are, in case you fell asleep, if the person next to you is uh, sleeping, wake them up. Uh, so we had 89 floods, 40 of them got down here, velocities up to six mile, 60 miles an hour. If you have the what we call flow rates, cubic meters per second, you take all of the flows of all the rivers in the world, add them up, uh, and multiply by 10, that's what we've got. It affected 16,000 square miles, Pacific Northwest, 530 cubic miles on the very, very first flood. Uh, and the first floods, the Missoula floods, between 15 and 18,000, ancient cataclysmic floods all the way through. Were early humans around here at that time? Most likely. The oldest established archaeological site in the United States is in Oregon, Paisley Caves, 14,000 calendar years ago. Uh, and it's out in central Oregon. Most likely early Americans were there. Where were they been? Been following the fish. They were probably on the Columbia River and they were wiped out by the floods coming through. That's the story of the Missoula floods and the Ice Age floods, incredible story of how science works and how it doesn't, and it affected all of us. We are all on Missoula flood sediments here. If any of you live in the West Hills uh, or the South Salem Hills, you're up on the Columbia River basalts, and you, many of you are on the Jory soil. Thank you very much for the invitation to come down and talk to you. So uh, I, we have time for a couple questions before we take a break. And so we have two microphones, and so we got a question already back there, so blur away. Yeah, this, uh, my name is Peter. This doesn't relate to the Missoula, but how do you compare that to the Grand Canyon and some of that, uh, what happened there? Uh, I'm sorry, so the grand, great question, Peter. Uh, and, and so the Grand Canyon has been uh, occurring, uh, it's erosion over the last 20 million years. And so the whole Colorado Plateau was uplifted about 20 million years ago. And that uh, relates to the subduction of a plate off of the coast called the Farallon Plate that caused the relaxation in the western half of the United States and an uplift of that area. And so the river was established there. So the, Columbia, uh, the Colorado River was established, and it's been downcutting for those 20 million years. Now, there's an alternate view on that. And it relates back to the Missoula floods, and the creationists believe that the Grand Canyon were created in, in Noah's flood. And that the, the Missoula floods, there's only one of them, and that was Noah's flood. 
but I showed you a lot of evidence of multiple flood hypotheses. Uh, and then I do a lot of slope stability work. And in the Grand Canyon, you have a lot of shale layers. And they believe that all of that was laid down in one event. And those shale layers would not have the slope stability that they have today uh, if they were in a liquid state. There's a question. Next one, right there. Uh, yeah, I'm Roz. Uh, how would you uh, describe the relative role or contribution of the elevation gradient versus the sheer volume of water in, in creating the erosion impact? Yeah, so the elevation is very, very important because especially it's elevation differences. Uh, and, and, and right where the water came out of the Columbia Gorge into Portland, there's a huge elevation difference. And so that it speeds the velocity of the water up. And then as the elevation differences uh, are not quite as great, then it slows the water down. But then uh, the higher the elevation, uh, it gives you greater amount of head and greater push behind it. Uh, and so uh, it's more elevation gradient differences that would lead to the faster velocities that you have. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, you have a question right here. Uh, yes. Uh, can we visit Paisley Caves? And if so, where is it? It's down there, Paisley, Oregon. Uh, and I don't think you can. Um, I, I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, and, and so... Uh, um, so I don't know much more about it. It was all excavated by the University of Oregon archaeologists, and that's basically what I know about it, okay? Good question. There is a question right there. Right here. My name is uh, David. Uh, was there any uh, Indian memory, of Native American memory of any of these floods, uh, and do we know much about that? Yeah, and, and, and for a lot of the other, uh, so thank you very much for that question. A lot of the other geological events, they do have uh, uh, examples like the eruption of our, our volcanoes, the big floods uh, during Cascadia along the coast, uh, and then the Bridge of the Gods landslide uh, uh, and the, the floods that were created by that. But uh, we're, we're talking going back 15,000 years ago. And I, it's just, I don't know what type of language that they have. Uh, there is no tradition that has been passed down. It's just a wee bit too far back in order to, uh, for anyone to have been brought through. Over here. Hi, this is Anne. Anne. Um, does the Snake River and Hills Canyon, is that part of Missoula floods? Oh, I love that. And so uh, Snake Canyon, uh, and um, there was another huge one flood uh, uh, during the, the glacial period. Uh, we had a large lake in Utah called Lake Bonneville. And if you visit Salt Lake City, you can actually see the shoreline, the, the capital, University of Utah. In fact, all the universities, Weber State, Utah State, uh, uh, Utah Valley, and BYU are all built on the shorelines of that. Uh, the lake level got way too high and went north and broke through into the Snake River floodplain and drained a huge amount of that lake. And that huge flood is called the Bonneville Flood. went down the Snake River floodplain and into the Columbia River floodplain. Uh, you can go up to Lewiston and Clarkston. Lewiston, Idaho, Clarkston, Washington. And in my longer version of this, I have got beautiful examples of Missoula flood sediments down here, up here, and in between the Bonneville flood. One flood with the dipping forset beds in between. And it is just like mind boggling to see uh, those two in between. So, yes. So that was the Bonneville flood. And it's, and it, it's towards two thirds of the way through the. Uh, the time period of the Missoula floods. Good question. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much for this. And I guess, how much time do we have until? Ten, ten, ten minutes. minutes. Ten minutes, come on back, and then we will tell you a little bit about terroir. My aim in life is to turn everybody into terroirists. We're going to talk about relationship between geology, soils, climate, and wine. Thank you again, B. And for those of you who uh, heard it before, uh, it's about 40 to 50 percent new. We got a lot of new data that's come up, and I had a Ph.D. student who finished her Ph.D. on this study, and so we got some neat little numbers towards the end. Uh, and so what we're going to do is come back here just to the primarily the Willamette Valley. 
Uh, and we're going to talk about wine. And as I mentioned before, we are the number three state in the United States in, with the number of wineries. And so wine is a huge part of our, of our uh, whole environment that we have here. And there's been a major change uh, in not only in Oregon, but all over the United States in uh, uh, drinking alcohol. And wine has just taken off like this. Uh, and, and so I've been working at the scientific end uh, trying to understand uh, the relationship between the geology, soils, climate, and wine. That's what we call terroir. And so my aim in life is to turn everybody into a terroirist and understanding this and enjoy all of this. Uh, and, and so I've been working with wine ever since college days. And so when I was at Stanford back down in the, the 60s, uh, um, we w had a whole bunch of fraternity brothers. and. And we would love wine, and so about every six weeks, we would go up to this fledgling new area that nobody had heard of that was growing grapes called the Napa Valley. And we would taste, and you could do the whole valley from one end to the other, starting at Mondavi and Louis Martini's in the, in the morning and ending up at Christian Brothers and Charles Krug at the end of the day. Now, to do the whole thing, uh, it takes a half of a month. Or, I mean, to do half of it, it takes a whole month. Uh, and so it, it has greatly changed, and right now, especially this year, uh, with the fires, oh my God, what a disastrous year there, both the Napa and Sonoma Valleys are having. So uh, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about that. Also, uh, my first teaching job was in Switzerland, so I taught there from 1970 to 75, the young be beginning professor. I, in addition to geology, I taught biology, and we were right in the middle of wine country. And so we would go down in the fall and pick grapes and bring it back. And the students would do primary fermentation, secondary fermentation. Uh, and there's a lot of chemistry and biochemistry involved in that. And then at Christmas time, they had a bottle of white wine to take home and give to their parents. They designed their labels. And they would give mom and dad a bottle of absolutely crappy wine uh, to show them that, why, that ed higher education was relevant. Uh, and uh, the $3,000 that their parents were spending on their college education was well worth it. And so professors have got it published. So my first paper I ever published was in the Journal of College Science Teaching in 1976. Uh, and it was, science can be fun and tasty, winemaking in the lab. And how do you do that? And so I did that. And then when I came back to Oregon, I, I'm also very involved in soils. Uh, and I was teaching a soils class, and all the grad students had to do a project. And uh, one uh, grad student said, I'm interested in wines. I said, nobody knows what soil they're on. None of the wineries do. We had 71 wineries at that time. Uh, and, and so she, uh, I said, you go out and, and start looking at what the soils are and what are the characteristics. And so we started gathering this together in 92, 93, and we put together the story, which is now the dominant story that every one of the wineries will be telling you about and this past year the Oregon Wine Association uh, they have a meeting February 21st and 22nd every year at the convention center Portland uh, and they get five big awards one goes to one of the founders one to the top winemaker one to the top vineyard manager one to the support of the vineyard pe people and then the top person supporting the wine industry I got that one so I got a nice little uh, decanter out of that. So I have been working with a lot of the wineries here, not only in the Willamette Valley, Southern Oregon wineries, uh, hired me to come down and visit every one of their vineyards together and put together a story after we put together the story here. And then I've also done the same thing up in the Gorge. So I know a wee, a wee bit about wines that are here and the whole uh, topic that we have got. And just to show you what I, my early credentials, here's a picture of me back in 1973. A young, assistant, a young assistant professor in Switzerland, uh, and these are some of the bottles of wine that my students made. Uh, in fact, this was the uh, uh, lead photo in the uh, faculty um, section of the yearbook that year, uh, and uh, that was back just before I got married. All right, so uh, major changes, as I mentioned it, it, back in 1982, they uh, did a huge survey of 50,000 people coast to coast in the United States of, uh, who drink alcohol. And what's your favorite alcohol that you drink? 49% of the people said beer. Si only 16% said wine and 35% hard liquor. So scotch, bourbon, martinis, etc. cetera, like this. They did the same thing again with a huge number back in 2002. And the beer drinkers, again, very, very high. In fact, many of them probably in Portland. 
Uh, but then look at what happened to wine. Went up to 40% and liquor went way back down to 12%. And, and so uh, people on the weekends, they go out to wine country and you do two or three wineries, you take it easy and you, you sip some wine. Lots of events, a lot of people get married in wineries. Back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, nobody did that. And when you go to social functions, what do you a lot of times drink? Wine. So it's been a major change that we have had there. So when you look at bottles of wine, and one bottle of wine is going to be different from the next and the next and the next, it's different based on eight different factors. Number one, obviously, is the grape. Uh, and a Cabernet Sauvignon is going to be different than a Pinot Noir, different than a Chardonnay, etc. Here in the land of Pinot Noir, we also have 12 different clones. The original Pomard and Vadensville from France, but then also we have 10 different Dijon clones. Dijon 114, 115, 777, etc. cetera. Uh, and so those will give you different flavors, okay, a as the grape does. Secondly, the geology, the bedrock or the sediments that are underneath break down into the soils. Those provide the very basic nutrients, and we'll talk about those later, that go into the making of the wine and different flavors. Number three, climate. When do we invite our friends to come to Oregon? It's always in July, August, and September. Why? Because it doesn't rain. Uh, and that's perfect for growing grapes. Secondly, we don't have humidity here. And so the temperature goes up in the daytime, it goes down at night, up and down. The more times it goes up and down, you have more complexity in your grapes. Back east, their temperature goes up and stays. It hardly changes uh, at nighttime. And so they don't get the complexities, number one. Secondly, with humid uh, uh, temperatures, uh, you get a high amount of molds and rusts and everything. And they have to spray 12 to 14 times a year. Here in Oregon, in Washington and California, because it's so dry, we only spray two or three times a year. So they, our wines are uh, much more competitive and much uh, neater. But secondly, it will show you a map of the world. All of the grapes are 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south uh, of the equator. It's that overall regional climate and then the, the localized climate, and we'll talk about that. Uh, also, soil hydrology. Uh, that is, you want it because we don't irrigate our grapes here in Oregon. Uh, you need to have enough uh, water holding capacity, enough silt and clay in the soils to hold water. So late in the season, when it's really, really dry, especially at the end of uh, uh, August and September, uh, there's enough water to keep the plants alive. Uh, and then all of those things will lead into the soil biota. Uh, and it's the fungi and the bacteria that actually affect all of the flavors that you have got. So the physical environment affects the others. Uh, and the Spaniards and the Italians uh, uh, study that and then the physiography elevation and orientation you don't want to have vineyards below 300 feet because you're on the Missoula flood sediments you don't want to really have it above 900 feet because you're too high and they won't ripen they won't get to that 23 24 percent sugar or 23 24 bricks that you have got uh, and so you want it to to ripen now the climate is every year getting warmer and warmer and warmer, and so uh, we have had no problem uh, maturing the grapes, even at those highest elevations. Uh, and so that, that elevation keeps moving up. Those ones right there are what we call uh, terroir. Uh, and in fact, the International Terroir Congress, which is held every two years, Last year was in McMinnville, the first time ever in the United States in the 24-year history. And so I got a chance to show all these guys from all around the world the soils here and the story of terroir here in the valley. But there are two other, uh, other um, factors that are important, but not terroir. Uh, and, and terroir is the taste of the place. Wines of this region will have a certain characteristic. Wines of this area will have a certain characteristic. But the most important factor uh, in the flavor of the wine comes from the winemaker. The winemaker, do you oak the wine or not? If you oak it, do you use American oak uh, or uh, the delicate French oak or Hungarian oak? Uh, what type of yeast do you use? Do you inoculate it or do you use the yeast that is on the grapes? Do you use malolactic fermentation? How long are the grape skins going to be in, in touching the, uh, the juice for your red wines? And things like that. Those all have great factors, but that is not terroir. That is the, the eventual flavor. And then vineyard management. Do the rows go north and south? Do they go east and west? Uh, do you have trellises? Do you have cover crop in between, which competes for water with the plant? plant? So those are the factors that affect uh, the flavors that you have got. But terroir is the total elements of the vineyard. It's the bedrock geology. It's the soils. 
I put a drainage, it's the color and the age. You want redder soils. Red soil means older soil, lower nutrients, and it means uh, well drained. That's your perfect soil here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and, and then it's the taste of the place. Now we use this term terroir uh, for a lot of other things and you're gonna see it in a lot of uh, things related to food because it's a taste of something, of a commodity. We use it for, uh, for uh, coffees, for hops. Anytime you go have an IPA, the, the brewmaster is gonna list where all the hops are coming from. That is a terroir type of thing. Cheeses, I gave a talk at a winery back in Vermont, uh, where they have four wineries. Uh, four years ago, and they use it uh, for uh, maple syrup because uh, maple syrups in different areas have different flavors uh, and cheeses. And then we have just started a new program at Portland State, and not me, but they're using my techniques, a young professor in the terroir of marijuana. Uh, in fact, he's presenting a paper in Seattle next week at our terroir conference. Uh, and so all of these things, uh, the, the soils, the climate, and all those factors will affect them. Dick Erath, one of the original four winemakers in modern day Oregon, says 80% of the quality of the wine comes from the vineyard. He's a terroirist. 20% comes from the winery. That's the winemaker. In a good year, like 2004, 2008, 2012, 14, 15, and 16, the winemaker just kind of sat back and let the wines make themselves. They didn't have to interfere. And, and so we, we all, we, I always look at the labels here. But 2000, or 1997, 2007, 2011, those are cool climate years, wet years, uh, El Nino years, uh, and, and they are problematic, and the poor winemaker has to really work hard in order to keep the wines from going bad. I still remember in 1997, Lynn Penarash, the head winemaker at, um, at Rex Hill Winery, uh, had 10,000 gallons of absolutely crappy uh, Pinot Noir, and the, and the owner said, you know, you gotta sell that. It's not very good. And so she marketed it as Vino del Nino. It was El Nino year. And her son, did, it was a first grader, did a wine label of stick figures with colorful balloons. And he, and he put it on here. And a lot of people buy uh, wine based on the wine label. And it was only $6 a bottle. And it sold out. At the end of the year, he said, you know, could you repeat that? And she said, no, I just saved you. This, it was crappy wine. It's interesting, I gave that talk up at Whitman College about four years ago, uh, and a little kid in the back, or a geology student raised his hand, he says, I was that kid who did that wine label. Uh, and that was Lynn Penderash's son, who became a geology major, and that's why she sold her winery, uh, because neither of her kids wanted to go into it, so she sent it, sold it to Kendall Jackson. Uh, and then, if you, here's a map of the world, and I think you can see North America, it's washed out South America, Africa, et cetera. All of the major wine growing areas are 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south uh, of the equator. I used to live in New Zealand. We had great Sauvignon Blancs. Australia, absolutely great uh, red wines. In South Africa, uh, they have very unique ones, Pinotage, which I don't like, but some of the others are great. And then the best Malbecs in the world from, uh, Mal uh, from over in Argentina, and then Carmenere, the great wine out of Chile and then in Europe and China. Uh, in a week and a half, I'm gonna be in uh, China and I will uh, drink another bottle of the Great Wall Cabernet. Is it any good? Eh, no. Uh, but did the wine, does the winery look like a perfect copy of a French Chateau? Yes, eventually it'll be good. But they're one of the major gr uh, wine group uh, producers in the world. Let's go back to uh, France and, and learn about the roots where Vitus vinifera, those are the grapes that we use for most of our grapes uh, in the United States. Um, and the, uh, these are the wine growing areas. Burgundy is right here. Uh, that We are the Burgundy of North America. Bordeaux is here, that's here. If we draw a line right through uh, France like this, this is all cool climate up in here. This is a warmer climate down here. And, and, and the Rhone Valley over here, Land of Syrah, these are the Bordeaux blends. Uh, Provence is the land of uh, your uh, uh, rosés. Uh, and then Burgundy is the land of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And the Pinot Gris comes from the Alsace area, which is up there. Uh, and so uh, in France, if you look at a wine label, they never will tell you what grapes are in that because you're supposed to understand the terroir. You are supposed to understand, it, it tells you the name of the wine, the, 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 the winery, uh, Grand, Premier uh, Grand Cru means an evaluation found in Burgundy and Bordeaux, uh, and there are certain areas have great terroirs and they get Grand Cru. 
Uh, this is the region, there's the year of the alcohol, but they never put the grape. You're supposed to understand, if it's red and from Burgundy, uh, it is going to be a Pinot Noir. If it's white and from Burgundy, it's a sh uh, Chardonnay. If it's red and from Beaujolais, it's going to be a Gamay grape. You're supposed to understand the terroir that you have got. Uh, and I love it. Uh, one of my friends was in France just two weeks ago, uh, and she said, here is, uh, this is La Maison de Terroir Beaujolais. So she was in uh, uh, the name of the, they use the terroir there still today a lot um, um, for that winery. Here is Burgundy. Uh, it's the same climate as we have in the Willamette Valley, but it has different geology. It's primarily limestone and marl, uh, and we don't have any, uh, we have a wee bit of limestone, but hardly any. Uh, and so, but the climates are the same, and we produce different style grapes because of that geology. And, and so for many, many years, the monks in Burgundy uh, were using this term terroir, and they always drew a line. And they said, above this line, it's the Grand Cru region, always the best wines. Doesn't matter who makes the wines, it's always the best flavor. The next region down is the Premier Cru, and then down at the bottom, uh, the River Deposits, is the or Van Ordinaire, or Ordinary Wine. And so geologists came out and looked at that. So here is your Grand Cru region, here is your Premier Cru, and here is your Ordinary Wine. And it's geological. Uh, here, in the uh, Premier Cru, it's all pure limestone. Whereas up here, it's marl limestone, which is a silty, sandy limestone. Uh, and that's the air. So the, the quality goes back to the geology, which is the terroir. Whereas down here, it's a river deposit and, uh, and a combination of a whole bunch of things. So the grapes that we have in most of the United States, except the northern part where it gets really cold and the vi grape vines uh, 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 get frozen in the wintertime, th there we have American hybrid grapes like the Norton grape. But the rest of us have the Riesling, Chardonnays, uh, Pinot Noir, et cetera, and that's what we have here, mostly in Oregon. And so Greg Jones, probably the greatest wine climatologist in the world, is an Oregonian. Uh, and he just moved from Southern Oregon University to Linfield, where Linfield started a new wine program. Actually, it started a few years ago, but he became the new, new director. And what he does is divide the whole world up into four climates, cool climate, intermediate, warm, warm, and hot. Uh, and, and it's all based on average temperatures or what we call growing degree days. And so the Willamette Valley, uh, you can see here, is in the cool climate, as is the Loire Valley, uh, Burgundy region of France, the Rhine Valley, Alsace, so the Germany, et cetera. Uh, those are cool climate areas. And then as we go into southern Oregon, we go over to Rio, Ha, Spain, uh, eastern Washington, Bordeaux. Uh, then you get in, in Chile, you get into warmer climates. Uh, and, and so you get into the heavy red types of wines, and that's intermediate warms. Then you get into California. That's the Napa and Sonoma, uh, South Africa, the Rhone Valley, Portugal, uh, and, and then Margaret River down in Australia, uh, and county region in Italy. That's what we call warm. And then you get into the really hot areas like Lodi, California, uh, and then Portugal, and then Australia. And so you, you, anytime you want to grow grapes, first of all, you determine where you are climate-wise. Then what you do is you match it up. So there's cool, intermediate, warm, warm, and hot. And then you match it up with the grapes that you have got. So cool climate grapes uh, that we grow here are primarily the German styles, Rieslings, Gewürztraminer, Mueller, Turgau, and, and then uh, Pinot Gris, uh, and then Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. And then as you get over into the intermediate warm, then you, get, uh, you start touching all of these. And then when you get into the warms, then you get into the Viognier, Syrahs, Cabernet, Sangiovese, Gr uh, Grenache. And then when you get into the real hot things, then your uh, Zinfandel, Nebbiola, and Raisins. Uh, and so what you do is you match your climate up with the, the grapes that you have got. Uh, and the best transparent grapes where you taste the differences in terroir uh, and the change, changes in soils are what we call um, uh, transparent grapes, are Rieslings, and the Germans have been telling us that for years and years. You have people tell you, you go up and down the Rhine River, the Mosel River, and you'll have two vineyards side by side. You have the same winemaker, going back to those factors, same years, and you taste the wines and they're different. Why? It's because of the soils, that's terroir. Uh, and it best shows up in the white wines, Rieslings and Chardonnay, 
Originally, we didn't include the Chardonnay because we did it the California style uh, with a whole bunch of oak and a lot of malolactic fermentation. You couldn't really taste the differences. Now, the Oregon style is going back to the Burgundian style. Uh, and so we'd use very little oak. It's more fruit forward, no malolactic fermentation. And now you can start tasting the difference in the terroirs. And then Pinot Noir of all the red grapes is thin skin. And so you can really taste those differences. As you get into the heavy reds, the calves, Merlots, and Syrahs, the, the varietal overtakes the flavors as compared to this. Uh, and so uh, all of these are cool climate grapes. So where are we here? Cool climate grape region. Where is the best place in the world to taste differences in terroir? Here. Uh, and I will be giving a talk next week in Seattle about that. Um, and then so if you want to quit your day job and start a vineyard, what do you need? Do you need to have 180 frost-free days a year? Well, that's no problem around here. But you uh, mineral nutrients, you want to have low nutrient soils. When you grow your garden in the backyard, what do you do? You fertilize it. You don't fertilize a vineyard. You want to have just enough nutrients to keep that plant alive. Therefore, all of the energy goes into the grape and not uh, into the leaves and the stems. You want well-drained soils, especially for the red grapes. Perfect slope is 7 to 8 degrees to the south, and you maximize your heat units. Uh, and then at 800, 900 feet maximum elevation. But as I said, as the climate is warming up, uh, that number keeps uh, going higher up. Minimum temperatures in the wor uh, wintertime, we don't have to worry about it around here because it just doesn't get cold. But in New York or up in Minnesota or Wisconsin, uh, a, a lot of times the plants, anytime the temperature is below negative 15 degrees, kills the plant. So there are essential elements that you need to have in the soil. And there are 10 macronutrients, three of them coming out of the water and the air, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen. But then phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and chlorine. You need to have a lot of that. And then you want to have micro, uh, lesser amounts of iron, manganese, zinc, copper, uh, boron, and molybdenum. The two ones that, if you, if you go out to your uh, wine plant and, it, and the leaves, instead of being dark green, are yellowish, most of the time you have, uh, don't have enough boron or molybdenum in the soil, and they generally produce sprays for that. And then you have these trace elements like lead, nickel, cadmium, mercury, arsenic, et cetera. These are parts per million. You need to have a little of that. And that will also t uh, change the flavors that you have got. Uh, and so you need to have those in the soils, and those together will uh, produce different uh, flavors. And then if we look at vineyard soils in, in general, first of all, uh, the depth of the soil is going to be important. For instance, Chardonnay loves a deep soil, whereas Syrah likes a very shallow soil. pH, so the acidity is very important. You want it between 5.5 and 10. Uh, and most of our soils are here. But once you get above 10, uh, the uptake of copper, iron, zinc, and manganese is a problem. And when it's really low, uh, the uptake of phosphorus is a problem. Uh, salinity, like, the, let's go out into the desert. Well, if you do that, you're going to have a lot of salt out there. Uh, and then that will affect the uptake of the phosphorus. Texture, that is the amount of sand, silt, and clay that you have got. And you want to have at least a little silt and clay in there for water holding at the end of the season because we don't irrigate. And then structure, that is how all the particles together. You have to have a little of that uh, because the tractors, et cetera, are going to be going over that. Drainage, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you have well-drained soils. Otherwise, the grapes swell up. And when they do that, the quality of the grape juice goes way down. Clay content will affect, uh, too much clay affects root penetration. Uh, and then color of the, uh, the darker the soil, uh, what happens is uh, it, it gives off heat. It absorbs heat in the daytime, gives it off at nighttime, so the grapes mature faster. Uh, and then red color means well-drained. Rockiness, uh, the more rocky uh, uh, rocks that you have in the, uh, the vineyard, they absorb heat in the daytime, give it off at nighttime, and again, speeds up the maturation. I, my favorite place to go to is Chateau Neuf de Pop in southern France, where you have all these quartzite boulders and cobbles all the way through the vineyard, uh, and they give off the heat at nighttime. And then limestone and caliche also uh, uh, affects the rooting depth that you have got. A good friend of mine, Terry Wright, down at Sonoma State, did a, a study, a blind tasting. This was Pinot Noir between, uh, from Iron Horse Vineyards in Sebastopol. You had Vineyard A, Vineyard B. Vineyard A had 42% clay. Same clone, same winemaker, same year. Everything was the same except the amount of clay in the soils. And everybody loved Vineyard B. Softer tannins, bigger nose, more elegance. 
Uh, and this one, deep cherry color, but it just wasn't as nice. And it goes back to the soil. So the soil, the terroir, is going to affect uh, the flavors that you have got. So I've had a chance to visit a lot of these places. This is the land of Malbecs. This is uh, down in uh, Argentina, Aconcagua, the big volcano there is, that is there. Uh, and all of these are fans that come off of the erosion of the, uh, of the uh, Andes. Uh, and, and then the river, because the, the mountains are uplifting, uh, the river's down cut and you have terraces on them. And the highest terraces have the most caliche and that's where the best Malbec comes from. And that's their terroir that they have there. You go over to uh, Australia, the soils are so old. They're all red, red, red. Uh, and the reason is uh, it, it, it very, very low nutrients. So you really stress the grapes and produce some great uh, heavy red wines because it's so hot there. So let's come back to Oregon. Uh, and, and so Papa Pino, this was David Lett, uh, back in the uh, early, uh, or in 1960s, finished up his uh, degree at uh, University of California, Davis. That is the mecca for all winemaking in the United States. And he says, I want to grow Pinot Noir. And uh, he asked the professors, where's the best place? And I said, the best climate is Oregon, but you'll never do it because it's just not a good place. So he came up here. Uh, he was the second guy to come to Oregon. Another guy, Richard Sommer, uh, opened a winery in uh, 1960 down in the Umpqua. He was the first one here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and every year, his Pinots got better and better. In 1975, he took his Pinot Noir to the International Pinot Noir Competition in Burgundy. Uh, and entered it, and it didn't win, but it was way up there, and the French said, Qu'est-ce que c'est? Où est Oregon? You know, what's going on here? Where is this Oregon place? Uh, and it put us on the map. And it was very, very important, so he, this was very important. So back then, that was the first planting. By 2016, so last year, we had 702 wineries, 28,000 uh, acres in the state of Oregon uh, in, uh, in wine. 70% uh, of our grapes here are red, 30% are white, and 60% of all wine is Pinot Noir, even in southern Oregon. So Pinot is the, the king here. And we produce that number of tons of grapes every year. So the, we have the cool climate grapes here are the Pinots and the German styles. It's inter and, and then Chardonnay, I didn't put that up there. It's interesting, uh, in, in 1990s, Pinot Gris, Gris was taking off. Everybody loves it. I still love it today. I think it's our best. The best Pinot Gris in the United States comes from here. But Chardonnay, uh, we are trying to compete with California, producing it with malolactic fermentation. We had the wrong grape. And everybody beavered off their Chardonnays and grafted on Pinot Gris. And then the guys growing uh, the German-style wines were only getting $6 a bottle, and you get $12 a bottle for the Pinot Gris. They beavered those off, too, and grafted on the Pinot Gris. So, the, uh, so we became a Pinot state uh, or a valley at that time. And then if you went to a winery and they were growing Merlots and Cabernet Sauvignons, you wouldn't even taste them because they would not mature here in the valley. Now you got to look and see where the grapes come from. A lot of them, the grapes are coming from southern Oregon or eastern Washington uh, uh, into the, the area. So if we look at uh, all of the United States and the number of wineries, California is number one, Washington's number two, Oregon's number three, uh, New York's number four. Uh, they have uh, the Finger Lakes area, and then their warm area is Long Island. But they also have Manischewitz, Ripple, and a few other large wineries, no, not great quality. Uh, and then look at who's number five, Texas. Uh, I was down to the final four in uh, San Antonio a few years ago. We went wine tasting north of there, did 12 wineries in three days. Uh, and was any of it good? No. But the beautiful uh, wineries, but eventually the winemakers will catch up and there'll be some very good wines uh, there. If you look at wine production, we go down to number four because Washington uh, or New York produces huge amounts of volume, and that's that Manischewitz and Ripple and, and those uh, jug wines, and they we're looking volume-wise. Uh, but uh, the effect here in Oregon, actually, we're up over $3 billion now. Uh, and that's, you know, the hotels, the restaurants, and everything else that are associated with that. So very important. So today, we have over 702 wineries, uh, over 1,000 vineyards. And the, the, why you say, why the difference here? Because there are a lot of people who are just farmers. They just grow the grapes, and then they get contracts with the wineries, and then they sell them to those. 41 different varieties that, that we produce. Direct sales of the wine, 708 million, uh, you mentioned there. And we had 3 million cases of wine in 2016. Uh, now, you, this is the number of acres in, uh, that are uh, 
being planted, but this is the harvested acres. The reason is when you plant grapes, it takes three years until you start getting a crop off, and, and that's the difference that you have got there. There is Pinot Noir, the king or the queen of all the grapes here in the valley. And, and so we have AVAs, American Viticulture Association areas. This is based on terroir, and you have boundaries uh, to them. And so the main one that we have in the Oregon is the Willamette Valley that you see here. Then you have the Umpqua, then you have the Rogue, the Applegate, and the Illinois Valley should be its own over there. And then we have the Columbia Gorge that is here. This is the Columbia Valley, which goes all the way up into Washington. Uh, and then this is over in the Snake River there. And then we have a new one that is in right there, which is your... Um, uh, the rocks of Milton Freewater, it's right on the border. One soil there, and those are the highest rated wines every year in the Wine Spectator and Wine Advocate. Uh, it's all Syrah, and it's just a great story that is over there. Now what we've done in the Willamette Valley, we've subdivided into now seven AV, sub-AVAs based on terroir. The people in Dundee Hills said, we have the Jory soil. We want to put Dundee Hills on our wine label. And then the people in Yamhill County said, we have primarily Willa Kenzie soil. We want to put that on there. The people in the Eola Hills right here said, we want to put, we have done, uh, we have uh, Jory and Nakaya soil. We want to put that on there too. And so all of, we have subdivided everything into these sub-AVAs. Uh, it is the Oregon thing though, instead of being competitive, they handed in all of those uh, applications the same day to Tobacco and Firearms, who was in charge of this, said, we are all friends. This is not a competitive marketing deal. We just want to put different things on our labels, and they do. Uh, and, and so it's kind of neat. Uh, and, and so back in the early 90s, I started out with a student, and, we, and nobody knew what the soils were. And so I said, Dion, you go out and start finding this, and then we refined it. It took us a couple of years to put all this together. And, and we found 23 uh, major soils here in the Willamette Valley. And so when we did our first study, we had did, done over 200 vineyards, 5,000 acres uh, at that time. Uh, and, and the dominant soil was the Jory soil, then the Willikensee, and the Laurelwood. These are what we call soil series names. Uh, and the, the Jory soil is basalt. All of that is formed on basalt that came all the basalt flows that came out of the hot spot, which is where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together. Came down, those flows came down the ancestral Columbia River and came down here and solidified here. All of the west, the Eola Hills, South Salem Hills, and all of the hills on the east side uh, of the Willamette Valley are all uh, Columbia River basalt. Uh, and the, the, the prim primary soil is the jory, and the, the soil classification is what we call ultisol, low nutrient. And that was the, the l largest volume there. Second one was Willikensee. These were the marine sediments. This is the uplifted coast range. Sandstones and shales that we have got there, all sedimentary types of rocks. It's what we call an alphasol. These are all old soils. So, if, and that's one of the key things that they all have in common, low nutrient. And then the Laurelwood soil is up primarily on Shehala Mountain, and it's a rim around the, the uh, Tualatin Valley, uh, Washington County. Uh, and uh, it is uh, primarily basalt, but it's windblown silt that has come off of the floodplains and then weathered for 50 to 100,000 uh, years. And they have these little BBs in it called piezolites, and I'm going to show that to you in, in a second. Uh, and those are the three dominant soils that we have here. And then the rest of these, like here's the Missoula flood sediments down here. You try and stay off of those Missoula flood sediments down here. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, we put all that together. And, and so the great debate in the middle part of the 1990s was what soil produces the best Pinot Noir? Uh, and it was, the, is it the Jory or is it the Willikensee? And then we fi started finding out that people really like Pinots grown on the Laurelwood. And the winemakers would have, uh, in the same year, using the same vineyard techniques, same winery techniques, same clones, and you, they would have two vineyards, and the, the, wine, uh, the grapes would come in, they'd make the wines all the same, and if they had different soils, they came out different flavors. They said, oh my God, they're different flavors depending upon the soil. So if you hold all the factors constant, uh, you start getting that. And they, they started uh, doing that. Uh, and as a result, uh, the great debate, which soil is producing the best Pinot Noir? Is it the Jory, is it the Willikensee, or the Laurelwood? 
And then, as I mentioned before, the Missoula flood sediments are down here. And 10% of our vineyards are down there. Most of those are primarily white grapes that you've got down there. Uh, and, and so here is the uh, 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 Dundee Hills. This is the Jory soil. I told you about that. It's our state soil. And here's a picture of it up close. Very, very red. And there's an A horizon up there. South Salem Hills, this is up to 100 feet thick. It is just highly weathered all the way down. Once you get into the Nakaya soils that we find here in the Eola Hills, um, that's very shallow, only up to a meter thick until you get into the bedrock. I love that soil because uh, once the roots get through the soil and into the bedrock, the flavors and the complexity of the soil changes. Ken Wright will tell you. I can tell when, uh, when we plant a new vineyard, I can tell the year uh, that all of the grape uh, uh, um, roots go through into the bedrock. Uh, here is the Willikenzie soil. Uh, this is at Elk Cove. I got a bottle of wine in there for side. Again, reddish in color, but not quite as red as the Jory, but still old. And these are these little piezolites uh, that are formed uh, through weathering of the, the soils. And the reason I drew this here is because I used to live in Louisiana, and we would go over to the Luss soils, the windblown soil, soils in Mississippi, and you'd have the young ones at 20,000 years old, no piezolites, but you go back to the ones that are 150,000 years old, and they were loaded with the piezolites, and the weathering through time produces those, uh, and so it's kind of fun. And, and they're concretions, and they're concretions of iron, silica, manganese, aluminum, titanium, sodium, potassium, uh, phosphorus, manganese, and calcium. Uh, and so, how do these wines taste different? Uh, and, and, and for me, I, in, in the early days, uh, I could all, you would pour the two uh, wines in comparing a Jory to the Willa Kenzie. I could always tell by the color. The jo uh, Jory soil, the basalt soil is always light red color, whereas the marine sediments were always dark red color. Uh, and the fruits, fruits would go, uh, flavors would go along with it. The marine sediments, the Willa Kenzie soils would be blackberries, black cherries, black plums, uh, uh, very, very strong finish, but not a great bouquet, but again, dark fruits, whereas the jory and the basalts were light red ones, red cherries, red plums, raspberries, red cherries, etc. Very strong bouquet. And then the laurel wood is somewhere in between and, and maybe a little more spicy. Now, Ken Wright, who was winemaker of the year for the Wine Observer last year, uh, and he says, Burns, you're a geologist. Most geologists drink wine out of a box. What do you know about terroir and flavors? And there's some truth to that. Uh, and, and he says, no, your basalt and your jory soils are fruit-driven flavors where the marine sediments are more floral, spice, like lavender, cola, tobacco, uh, uh, cedar, and anise. And then Adam Campbell, who has vineyards in each one of these, the Jory, the uh, Willa Kenzie, and the Laurelwood. He, uh, and I was out there last Sunday with a wine tour group, uh, and, uh, and he, they now market it as the Terroir Trilogy. And you can buy bottles from each one of the marine sediments, the Laurelwood, and the Volcanic, invite people over for dinner, and then you have three wine glasses for them to taste, and then have them taste the differences. And the only difference that they have there, because the same year, same winemaker, everything's the same except the soil. And he says the marine sediments are more black, cherry, and silky. And these are the dark fruits, as I mentioned before, whereas the volcanic is more red pie cherry and spice, the red fruits that you've got. And then the laurel wood is kind of blue fruit and more earthiness. And I love the, these characterizations. Uh, all your winemakers are going to have different uh, interpretations, but the thing they want to do agree on is the flavors are different. Uh, my PhD student, Kat uh, 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 Barnard, uh, looked at all of these and she found out that there were some differences between the sediments, uh, marine sediments, the basalts, and the wind blown. Uh, the, uh, and, and these are your macronutrients. For instance, phosphorus is very, very high uh, in your basalt soils and wind blown soils, but very low in the marine sediments. Potassium, low in the wind blown. Calcium, the same in all. Magnesium, high in the, the wind blown ones, medium in the um, uh, marine sediments and very low in the basalts and sulfur, very, very high. Uh, and then uh, in the macro, micronutrients, uh, very, very high in the basalts in iron, cobalt, manganese, uh, and then uh, marine sediments were very high in sodium because of salty uh, um, material that, you know, during deposition. Uh, and then looking at the heavy metals and trace elements, most of them no differences statistically, but 
Basalt is very, very low in arsenic. In California, arsenic in the wines is a big deal right now. So our Jory and the Ola Hill uh, uh, wines, very, very low in arsenic, which is really good. Strontium is low in marine. Vanadium is very high in basalt. And so if we want to look at a wine and see the differences, all we have to do is just sample uh, strontium and vanadium, and generally we can figure that out. We have great wineries in Southern Oregon down in the Umpqua. Uh, I wish I had more time to go into that, mostly on river terraces and slopes. Uh, up in the Columbia Valley, oh my God, if you go from Hood River to the Dalles, you get every mile, it's an inch less precipitation. You go from Burgundy to Bordeaux in 20 miles. Cool climate grapes on Underwood Mountain, and then by the time you get up to the Dalles, you're into growing Zinfandel. In fact, the oldest grape vines in the state were planted in 1892, the Pines Vineyard, and it, it, it's, old, it's true old vine Zinfandel that they've got here. Walla Walla on the other side of the state, my God, do they produce uh, great, uh, I think the best um, Syrahs in the United States are coming out of there. But their cabs were lows, big heavy reds, all very, very, very good over in that particular area there. The terroir differences that we have in the Pacific Northwest, as I mentioned before, Washington, 95% of the vineyards are on the Missoula flood sediments. How do they reduce the vigor? They do it primarily through drip, drip irrigation. Whereas here in the Willamette Valley, 90% of the vineyards are in the upland areas and only 10% on the Missoula flood sediments. So how do we reduce the vigor? It's by having those old red, low nutrient types of soils that we have. Now I look around the room and a lot of you are just like me, retired. And, and uh, Oregon State, which has an incredible enology and viticulture program, and this is the land of Pinot, has developed a new Pinot just for us. Uh, and this new one is a hybrid grape that acts as an antidiuretic. Uh, it is expected to reduce the number of trips that older people make to the bathroom every night, and this is going to be marketed as Pinot More. So what you got to do is head down to Safeway or Fred Myers and ask the sommelier there, do you have any of that new Pinot grape for me? Um, so, so how about the conclusions about terroir? Uh, and so the importance of terroir, remember it's those eight factors that I talked about before. Uh, and, uh, and six of them are uh, for terroir. The other ones, the winemaker, especially in a cool year, the very, very important. Geology and soil is an important factor. Is it the biggest factor? No. Uh, but it, here in the Willamette Valley, it does have a decision making difference between uh, the three different soils and the different flavors. Three wineries, as I mentioned, uh, Elk Cove, um, Shehalem, and Lang all have terroir, terroir trios or terroir uh, trilogies or uh, terroir triplets. Another interesting thing is Riesling is making a comeback, and there is a winery just up the Eola Hills from here, Brooks. It's just before you get to Amity. They and Trisadum, which is on Ribbon Ridge, uh, are highlighting uh, the differences in terroir, and they have, the again, the Jory, the Willikensee, and the Laurelwood soils. Uh, and, and you have the same winemaker, same years, and so I was there again on Sunday and tasting the difference, and oh my God, they are all different. And so Rieslings are fun. When we were, I'm saying we, looking around, a lot of you are my age. Uh, in college, we drank a lot of Blue Nun. Uh, and, and Blue Nun, high sugar content, like 5, 6, 7% sugar, uh, and not very good Riesling. Uh, and nowadays, we are getting low, uh, lower and lower sugar, dry Rieslings. Many of the dry Rieslings we have are dry, and my God, the flavors are ab absolutely good. They're fruity, but they're still uh, not sweet. So uh, get out there and try not only the differences in the Pinots, but also in the Rieslings. Uh, Southern Oregon, Eastern uh, Washington, uh, th they control the uh, uh, vigor through irrigation. Willamette Valley, these are all cool climate grapes. Keep off of the Missoula flood sediments. Eastern uh, Washington, Eastern Oregon, the warm climates that you have over there, that, that's the land of Cabs, Merlots, and Syrahs. So now I christen all of you terroirists to go forward uh, and study this terroir with all vigor possible. Now, we reduce the vigor to produce great terroir, but then, and, and when you go into the wine tasting rooms, uh, I want you to ask always three questions. Uh, wh what is the year on the, the bottle? 
because remember I said 2004, 8, 12, 14, 15, and 16, great years. But if it's 1997, 2007, 2011, those were wet years, difficult years. The good news is a lot of people didn't buy the wine in 2007, 2011, so they're stuck with it, so they put a lot of that in the back the sellers, they started drinking it seven, eight, nine years later, and oh my God, it just smoothed out and quite elegant. And so, so some of those now are really, really good. So ask the year, what is the clone? Is it uh, uh, Vadensville or Pomard, the uh, Pomard, one of the original ones, or is it one of the Dijon clones? And thirdly, what's the soil? Is it a Jory uh, or Cousins? Is it a Willa Kenzie? Willa Kenzie has been subdivided into nine different groups. Or is it a Laurel Wood, which is the main one there? And I think you, you will enjoy wine tasting. It is a fun thing to do, especially in the afternoon on a beautiful day, not a day like today. So go forward and enjoy wines. Thank you very much for the chance to come and talk to you. So we have a question down here. So we have the first one, and then we have the microphone people coming around here. There's our second one back here. So yes. It's really a story. It's not a question. Sharon and I were, were on a cruise ship in Buenos Aires, and we went ashore and went in a wine store to get some wine. And they, when we walked in, they said, where are you from? We said, Oregon. They said, ha ah, ha, Pinot Noir. Yes. And, and it's true. I mean, we uh, the uh, around the world, Pinot Noir, uh, Oregon is is known for Pinot Noir. Now, that's the Willamette Valley. That's where we produce the best Pinot. But Southern Oregon, it's warm, and they are producing huge amounts of Pinot. Where does most of that Pinot go? North, and it's sold to A to Z Willamette Valley vineyards. Those go into their their normal uh, uh, high volume. Uh, uh, Pinot, and it adds a little body to it. It's a little fatter than up here, uh, but I I even in those environments, a warmer environment, they're growing a cool climate grape, uh, and so it's not quality, but it is good. Now, there are a couple places down there in southern Oregon uh, that uh, are producing some very good Pinots where it is a localized uh, cool climate area. We have a question back here. Yes, Pat here. Uh, I was wondering who or what determines the cost of wine? And is the wine that much better as the price goes up? Well, and so uh, for, you'll notice that most of your white wines are lower priced than the, the Pinots. Uh, and the reason they're all fermented in stainless steel, and so you don't have a lot of great cost. Once you buy a barrel, once you put that uh, Pinot Noir onto oak uh, for a year, year and a half, uh, a barrel costs $1,000 and you use it three years. Uh, and, and so the reason Pinot Noir or Cabernet or Merlot or Malbec, any of those are much more expensive is, that the, is the oak. And so the oak is the major deal that you have got there. Uh, uh, many of you have probably had two buck chuck, Charles Shaw wine uh, out of uh, Trader Joe's. And it's all grapes from the Napa Valley, but it's all grapes that are three, four, five, six, seven years old. The new grapes that really haven't developed complexity. And what they do is they ferment them in the stainless steel vats, the 10,000 gallon vats, uh, and so they can keep the price down. Uh, and, uh, but eventually those grapes will go, once they get the complexity after 10 years old, they won't be going into Charles Shaw. Uh, and so, so oaking is one of the major things that will do this. Now, some of them, it's snob appeal. And, and Domaine Serene is one of our most expensive wine. It's 30 bucks to go wine tasting there. I won't go there because it's way too expensive for the quality of the grapes. But the, the, the wines are good. Uh, but uh, they just say we, uh, we are cut above and so we're going to have higher price. So some people have higher prices. But, uh, uh, I mean, the, there's the old joke, you know, uh, how do you uh, uh, gain a, uh, a, a small fortune in the wine business? Well, you invest a large fortune. And, and, and the ca capital costs are huge. So a lot of these wineries, uh, all of the, the tractors and the destemmers and the barrels and the fermenters, it's expensive and it takes you a long time to get those capital costs back. Good question. We have a, yeah, we right have a question there. David, uh, my question has to do with the relationship between rain. Like, we get rain in the wintertime, and then we have a dry summer, and uh, that's really important, I would assume, to 
some types of grapes. Yeah, so, so we are the xeric moisture regime here. And so we don't care how much rain we get in the wintertime because a lot of it will go and be stored in the soil. It's that summertime. It's that June, July, and August that you want to be dry, 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 and you really want it all the way through until October. Uh, and, and so you, you don't get any of the mold. You, uh, and you get to your 23, 24% sugar or 23, 24 bricks. Uh, and so uh, the wine, wine people don't worry about the, the rain this time of the year, especially if they've got all the grapes in. Now, there are a few wineries that still don't have their grapes in, and today's rain is not very good for them. Uh, because what happens is the grapes will, uh, will absorb some of that water and get fat, and uh, the quality goes down. So, uh, but once you've got your grapes in, nobody cares about it. And he's, he's another University of Colorado uh, graduate, so fellow buff there. So thanks for the good question. Question here. Well, I'm just getting ready to close and thank you by sharing something that's on the wall at Amity Vineyards. I don't know if you've seen it, but it says, in the order named, these are the three hardest things to control, wine, women, and song. <laughs> Well, thank you. And thank coming you. from a musician like you are, I think that's a lovely thing there. So, so thank you very much for coming out today.